emergency room in Egan talking with Dr. Rob Anderson about shingles and what you can do to protect mm -hmm. yourself against it. Yeah. So first of all, what is shingles? Well, shingles is a reactivation of a virus in our body that we get from chicken pox. Typically when we're a kid, if you're over the age of 40, most people, I think they say 99.5% of people born in the U.S. had chicken pox when they were a kid. If you're born after 1995, there is a, a vaccine to help prevent getting chicken pox. But anybody who has had either of those has the risk of having that virus reactivated and you develop this rash just on half of the body. Typically it burns for a couple days and then the rash develops and can kind of sing and hurt. It's pretty painful. So are there certain people that are more at risk? that yeah. get it than others? You can get it at any age, but typically after we pass the age of 50, we're a little bit more prone to getting shingles. So obviously I'm past the age of 50 mm -hmm. and I had chicken pox as a child, so what should I be doing to protect myself against getting shingles? So there are two vaccines that you can get that are approved by the FDA. One came out about 10 years ago, Shingrex, and then the other one is Vastavax. You can talk to your family doctor or internist about getting that. The latter one that came out in 2017 is a little bit more difficult to get because it's on short supply. But that's one where you have to get a shot one time and then between two to six months later you get a second shot, a booster of that. And it doesn't cure it, it doesn't prevent it 100%, but it decreases the likelihood of you getting shingles um, later on. And that's something that you can get here at the urgency room then? You know, unfortunately it's not a vaccine that we carry here at our facility. It's something typically more that the primary care doctors um, will give you. But we see a lot of people that come in here that have shingles. A lot of people come in and they just have this horrible pain in this rash and they just don't know what it is. And oh. it's just, it is so uncomfortable. Um, so we see people come in all the time with that. And it's important to be seen as soon as you see the first signs of the rash. There's a medicine, it doesn't cure it. It's an antiviral, it helps decrease the severity of the illness. And the benefit to starting that right away is it makes it's more effective. So if you wait a couple days and then are seen for this rash, it still is not going away. The medicine is not as effective. So as soon as you see any sign of a rash, we recommend coming in so we can take a look at, at the rash and see if it is shingles. And you were saying um, you see it more in the older population, but kids and children can also get it as yeah, well. Yeah, so it is possible. There have been cases where you know younger kids have gotten it. Um, typically, um, we don't know for sure why people get shingles. We know that it's a reactivation of the herpes zoster virus. It lies dormant in our spinal column or kind of our back nerve area. And it's reactivated typically through stress. Some type of like physiologic stress or some type of illness could do it. Um, a lot of stress at work or home, whatever could be going on, um, that can reactivate the virus and then all of a sudden you break out this painful rash. You know, and I, under I was reading too that um, not only yourself, you have the rash and it's painful mm -hmm. and stuff, but you can give it to unsuspecting mm -hmm. children or mm -hmm. pregnant women. Yeah. I mean, what are the risks for that? Yeah, so there's a high risk. It's very communicable. People can easily get it. So with How shingles, is it spread, then, really well, with shingles, it's typically the vesicles that are most contagious. Um, so you can get shingles on any part of the body. So it's only going to be on half of your body. Oftentimes people will get it on the trunk, so just on half of their, their chest or their tummy. Sometimes people will get it on the face, and it's the actual vesicles that contain the yellow serous or kind of that yellow fluid that's really contagious. They say and there might be a component of this being airborne too, which is I was just going to ask, yeah. do you have to actually be in contact with it? or Typically cl close contact. Um, you can spread it that way. So we advise if you are going to be around people who have not had chicken pox or are immunocompromised if they're on chronic prednisone, diabetes, on chemotherapy for cancer, for HIV, et cetera, you want to be really careful and, and maybe avoid even contact with those patients until all the lesions have crusted over, then you're not considered contagious anymore. But it's really those vesicles that are quite contagious. And the other population you have to be very careful about it are the pregnant women. So that virus can actually be transferred to the baby inside a mom still um, and cause some um, harmful effects to a baby. Oh, that would be horrible, mm -hmm. wouldn't that? Yeah. yeah. 
So where can our, our viewers get more information about shingles and about the vaccines and things like that? You know, a lot of people that's come into our facility, um, they come in, you know, when they have the rash, and then we're happy to talk through all that, talk about different complications. You can get um, a skin infection, so you can get a, a cellulitis on top of it. Sometimes people oh, wow. have the rash, <laughs> it's just so painful and bad, they're scratching at it. Um, maybe not taking care of it the best, and all of a sudden you get this secondary bacterial infection of cellulitis. It's not too common, but it's possible. So people come in oftentimes, and we review that with our patients when they come into any of our facilities here in Egan, Badness, or Woodbury. They come in, we kind of go through those details with them, uh, prescribe the antiviral antibiotic if needed, um, and, and really we're happy to talk about that. Final advice yeah. for our viewers? Yeah, if you have any rash, we'd be happy to see, you know, you just come on into our facilities. We're open from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. every single day, including weekends and holidays. We'd be happy to chat with people and talk to them about it more. Well, as, as always, great advice. Thank, Thank you, Jody. That. Thanks for being here. And we'll be back with more right after this. Drownings are the number one cause of accidental death for young children. Simple safety steps are the best way to prevent these tragedies. Make sure kids learn how to swim. Designate an adult water watcher to watch kids in and around water. Save the phone calls and texts for when the kids are out of the water. Properly fence all pools with fences at least four feet high and with self-closing, self-latching gates. When above ground pools aren't in use, remove the ladders. When pools aren't in use, cover them. Teach kids to stay away from drains. And if a child is missing, check the pool or spa first. Consider the steps you take, then add a few more. Because you never know which pool safety step will save a life. Until it does, simple steps save lives. To learn some new ones, visit poolsafely.gov. Did you go tanning? You're getting so tan. We need some sun. Protect yourself. Protect your friends. Stop tanning. Learn more at SpotSkinCancer.org. The opiate crisis hit the Twin Cities hard a few weeks ago after there were an alarming 175 overdoses and 17 tragic deaths in a two-week period. One family shares their personal story in this next video about how the opiate crisis took their young son's life and how they hope by speaking out they can help save other lives. Here's Josiah's story. Josiah, he was just a good, good kid. A kid that just loved life and lived it to the fullest extent uh, in every aspect. He was always the life of the party. He was the class clown every single year. Uh, on a down day, would just bring a smile to your face because of his laugh. He was everybody's friend, always played sports, always made straight A's. I don't think he had one single enemy. Everybody who ever knew Josiah loved Josiah. Drugs doesn't play favorites, it will hit anybody and everybody. When we found out that our son was on drugs, he was off at college. The feeling was complete isolation and terrified and your whole world is shattered. Anybody and everybody who is close to the addict, it affects everybody. I had the stigma of drugs that anybody who was on drugs came from the streets. And it's not necessarily the truth. I mean, it can affect anybody. It affected me. It affected um, our house. It affected our kids. Um, it affected my wife and I. And it affected our community. To see your son, who you have to kick out of your house, be homeless, it, it changes every part of an American family. And for the worst, obviously, it, it wrecks your home. It has the ability to wreck your home. My son's story can get out to the public and let them know that don't sweep this under the rug. That admit that we have a problem and let's let's uh, let's work on it and, and come through and and get and come away with a good outcome. We would like you to partner with us and to jump aboard with us and try to put the word out there to let other families who are going through this understand. Get inside of a family who has gone through this. It's a story that should not go untold. It's a story of, of small town America 
coming out. I mean, we hear of these stories all the time in the big cities, and, and sometimes your little small town areas, just nothing ever is, is said or exposed about that. And other families who experience this, other families who don't know anything about drugs, don't know anything about what to do with their kids on drugs, we want to put our story out there to help any and everybody that we can. One kid, one, one girl, one man, any, anybody we possibly can would mean a life not lost. If our story, if Josiah's story can help even one person, but I want it to help many people, we're willing to put our story out there to try to help, to try to make a difference. Drug addiction kills 70,000 people already this year and it's something that we need to jump on board with. And so I'm just asking anybody and everybody that will to jump on board with us and help us get this word out, help us make a change in our country, in your neighborhood. You never know if it's gonna to happen to you. I'm a veteran. We hit a mine in Vietnam. When I came home, I didn't know where to turn. As America's veterans face challenges, DAV is there. My victory's been never giving up hope. My wife is always there to remind me we have a life to live. DAV provides a lifetime of support, helping veterans of every generation get the benefits they've earned. I am a veteran, but after I got out, I spent two years alone and homeless. Every year, DAV helps more than a million veterans so they can reach victories great and small. My victory was finding the support to get back on my feet. Now I'm getting things right with my family. I finally admitted with my PTSD, I wasn't doing well. But there's more to be done and more victories to be won. Now I wish I'd found DAV sooner. I am a veteran. My victory is just enjoying each day. Help support more victories for veterans. Go to DAV.org. Do you worry about how much someone drinks? Do you feel angry or depressed most of the time? Do you feel neglected or unloved? Do you feel that if the drinker loved you, she or he would stop drinking? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you are not alone. Not everyone trapped by alcohol is an alcoholic. Families and friends are suffering too. Al-Anon and Alateen can help. Call 1-866-200-0223 or visit alanon.org slash help. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. Joining us now to talk about mental health first aid is Alyssa LaRue-Smith, and she's with Fairview Health Services. So thank you for, for being with us. Thanks for having me. And specifically with the Community Health Program and Innovation. Um, so what is mental health first aid? What is it all about? Mental Health First Aid is an international evidence-based training program that teaches people how to recognize some warning signs and symptoms of a mental health problem or crisis, and then also how to uh, reach out and offer help to somebody um, and to connect them with professional resources. So it's just like regular first aid or CPR, only we're talking about supporting people that aren't injured, but people that are dealing with a mental health problem. So how does, how does this specifically work and how effective is it? Well, it's an eight-hour training course, and it's taught by two uh, certified instructors. And it works by really working to increase mental health literacy. So it's providing... What, what is mental health literacy? <laughs> so it's providing that um, kind of mental health 101 knowledge and information about what is the prevalence of mental illness in our country. Um, what do symptoms of depression look like? What does crisis look like? And that works to increase our knowledge and then also to start to... Um, combat some of the stigmas and misunderstandings we have about mental illness, which of course is going to increase more of that understanding and comfort with uh, supporting somebody. And then it's a practical training, so it teaches a five-step action plan for if you're in a situation where somebody might be having a mental health problem, um, how do you help them? What can you do? And so just like first aid or CPR has the mnemonic, um, the ABCs, a mental Health First Aid has what's called ALGE, A-L-G-E-E. -E. So it's that, again, that action plan you can just say, okay, 
Um, you can call up that, that plan in your head and go through steps uh, to try to help somebody. I think some people think, you know, um, well, if I bring it up, that's going to make the situation worse. But you're saying that's not the We're case. We're saying it's the, the opposite. At least yeah. Mental Health First Aid says it's the opposite. And that, that all too often we're hearing in our communities that, oh, you know, I, I noticed somebody seemed to be struggling or there was an issue, but I, I don't know what to do or I don't know what to say. And so people don't do anything, unfortunately. And that's such a missed opportunity. Who should be um, taking these classes or the course? It's a course, an eight-hour yeah. course. Yeah. Yes. So it's almost easier to say who shouldn't be taking the course. Okay. <laughs> One of the strengths of it is its universal appeal. And um, it's really mental health and uh, substance abuse addiction uh, doesn't discriminate. So it's applicable really to everybody. Um, but specifically, it's for adults, uh, so ages 18 and above. And um, I would say if you are a mental health professional, it's probably going to be too basic for you because it's really a community-based program. So it's that, again, that 101 level kind of information um, that we need to gain that better understanding. And why does Fairview provide this course? Well, Fairview provides this course because um, a good, effective mental health care system really exists on a continuum. So we have prevention, early intervention, we have treatment services such as like outpatient therapy, we have more intensive services, inpatient chemical dependency treatment, and then we have a crisis, crisis management. We have like a behavioral health emergency center for mental health crises. Um, most of those earlier prevention and early intervention initiatives don't exist within the hospital. They exist outside in the community. And so Fairview really recognized an opportunity to bring that, bring its expertise, its resources out into the community to make an impact on the system in that, those earlier stages, um, which is so important to having, again, that overall comprehensive, solid healthcare system. It's really changing the way people think about medical care, I believe, right? More in that prevention, more community-based and things right, like that. Right, right. And, and research does show, it's just like every other um, physical disorder with a mental illness, the longer it's left untreated, um, the longer symptoms go on, the worse it's gonna get and the harder it is gonna be to achieve recovery. So um, research shows that if um, somebody close to you is likely to suggest treatment or professional help, the more likely you are going to be to, to seek it. And maybe that would have helped the, the young man that was in the previous video that um, the viewers just saw, you know, that he didn't get this help and it was too late for him, but Absolutely. it could help somebody else. Yeah, especially right. with our, the recent um, number of cases that we had here in the Twin Cities, just with the opiates right. alone, not to mention depression and other mental um, health issues and stuff right. like that. That core message of the course is that early intervention piece. And so really trying to reach people before it gets to the crisis point where they might need a behavioral health emergency center. How often do you hold these um, courses and where are they held? And well, Fairview does around um, 30 to 40 classes a year and we're doing wow. them across the state and um, pretty much everywhere we have a hospital in, in that surrounding community is where we're hosting classes. So pretty much where this TV show is airing then too, <laughs> yeah, around yep. the Twin Cities. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So, and we, it's important I think to note too that we, we bring the class to the community, so we don't typically have classes inside our facilities, but we really want to go where people are and people feel safe to gather and comfortable. So we're going to churches, nonprofit organizations, community centers, um, anywhere else that's really accessible for the public. What's the, the cost to participate in the course? Um, another way we're trying to reduce barriers to attending is um, by making our courses free. Oh, so that's wonderful. we really felt that um, this information is so important to get to people that cost should not be a barrier to attend. So um, typically this course values about $150 per person. It's again, it's eight hours of training. It um, offers a, th a certification that's good for three years. Um, and so it's a, it's a great value. Oh wow, but, that's really nice. Yeah, it's a really great value, but again, we, want, we recognize that um, this information is important to all of people in our communities. So well, what do you think about being to offer this program and course to the community personally? Personally, I'm so proud to be part of this program. And I actually was an instructor for about four years. Um, and I'm, I love this program because I've seen it work. And 
I've used the training myself and it's really prepared me even though I have work experience in um, mental health treatment. Um, but there are times when this stuff happens and you never know and to be able to kind of stop and say okay how can I really really focus on the needs of this person and maybe put aside my my personal feelings um, and to connect them with help whether it's a colleague or a family member or even a stranger that you might encounter. Mm -hmm. So we do a, a six-month follow-up of participants that have taken the class to find out are they using this information and how are they using it and yes, people are using this information. Wow, that's we have really nice. Wonderful examples of um, the different ways people are using it, whether it's the resources they're learning in class or intervening in a crisis, um, supporting students that come to them um, in need of help. People are using it. You said that you've used that training. Can you give us a little specifics about how you were able to use it? Sure, I've um, encountered situations at work in, in a previous role where um, we had uh, an individual that was maybe ex experiencing um, more of a crisis level and so it, it helped me as I was in a manager role to sort of take that position saying, okay, let's, let's go through the steps, let's walk through the action plan and offer help and, and really express to that person at the time that I was concerned about them and that I cared about them and that I think helped kind of calm the situation down and the person opened up and, and I was able to suggest some, some resources for them to, to get some help. You know, it's that um, complex eight hour course, but for our viewers, can you give us some, some tips, maybe some, like people say, I don't know what to ask or I don't know what to say. I mean, is there some tips that you can share with our viewers right now that they might be able to take away? Well, I think one of the most important things that this course teaches um, is really about that crisis intervention. Um, it does talk about just a general problem that's not a crisis, of course, but we also recognize that um, crisis is, is huge. And the first step in the action plan is to assess for risk of suicide or harm. So safety is always going to be at the forefront of whatever you do. Mm -hmm. um, and say, for example, you are with a, somebody and maybe they're having some, uh, they're expressing some feelings about um, not wanting to continue with life or um, feeling very hopeless. And you've noticed maybe they've been withdrawing from, from their social activities or from work. Um, they've... Perhaps maybe you know of their history. Perhaps they've had a past attempt at suicide or they have a family member. If they have an organized plan, mm -hmm. there's some other risk factors, for example, that might be not as commonly known, such as if they're male. Uh, males have four times greater a risk of completing suicide than females. Oh, yeah, no What's idea. What's their age? Um, teenagers, older adults also are at higher risk. So if you see all these things when you're interacting and you might be concerned somebody's at risk of suicide, what mental health first aid is going to teach you is to express your concern, to talk to that person and say, I'm concerned about you and this is what I've, I'm seeing. Are you having thoughts of suicide or are you thinking of killing yourself? And to really come out and ask that question. Um, we have a, a misunderstanding in our society mm -hmm. that asking that kind of a question might implant the idea in somebody's head that that maybe they weren't thinking about it, but now because you said something, they are thinking about it. But we've found that it's actually the, the opposite is true. And it, it doesn't yeah. promote somebody. And that's what you really need to do is to come out and ask that question um, because it could be a lifeline for that person. They might have been waiting for that opportunity to sort of share, yes, this is where they're at right now and they are having some, some sui suicidal thoughts. Um, and so that's, again, what the, the program is, is teaching, is how to, um, to really overcome that fear we might have um, in addressing something in somebody and, and connecting them with help. Wow, like, you know, um, making it available in the community, having more people with these um, skills and training could really, really save lives. I mean, just like CPR and some of the other things that are available. Absolutely. And we actually have a wonderful um, story of a police officer that took one of our trainings a couple of years ago from Egan. And he um, shared the story with us and had, there's a great video out there um, about how after he took the training, he encountered shortly after a woman that was um, a, about to attempt suicide off of a bridge. And he used his training and talked her down 
and then was able to again get her to help. And he completely uh, attributed it to taking the training. Wow, I remember the case, but I didn't realize it was he had had this special training too. Right, wow. right. Even somebody who's trained, of course, but um, the mental health first aid kind of taught him about his approach and how is he really going to approach this woman who doesn't know him and might be afraid of him. And, and so that was a, a wonderful story of how it works. Any other advice or tips for our viewers on if, they, if they're concerned about a loved one or, or even themselves, I suppose, too? Yeah. Well, I would definitely encourage people to take the training. I think it's um, a really great way to just gain more information and understanding. And I would also encourage people not to be afraid. And if they have concerns, um, to, to really don't be afraid to reach out and to try to help. And, and from a, a bigger picture for us as a society and as community to start to move beyond that fear and offer support to our, our family members and our loved ones um, that might be experiencing mental illness because they need just as much support as somebody who would be facing any other illness in their lives. Final comments for our viewers about mental health, about mental health first aid. I'd say I hope that you join us and take a class and continue to, to learn more about um, mental illness and mental health and how we can support each other in, in creating healthy communities and in, in society. And they can find out where you're having the, the classes at, at your website. At the yep, fairview.org slash mental health first aid. All right. Well, this has been really interesting and we're glad to have you on the show and good information thank you for so our much. viewers. So I, thank you, Alyssa. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank Thanks. you so much. And we'd like to thank you for joining us. We hope you'll join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone. Mm -hmm.